right, Carl, thanks so much. Welcome to the Halftime Report. I'm Scott Wapner, front and center this hour, the Everything Rally. Stocks hitting new highs yet again. We're trading the markets today, as we always do with the Investment Committee. Joining me for the hour, Josh Brown, Shannon Sakosha, Kerry Firestone, and Jim Labenthal. We'll take you to the markets. We are green everywhere. Russell's not, but it's not down by all that much. And it is coming off its highest close since November of 21. Josh, retail sales better than expected today. I said we're at record highs, and we're calling it the Everything Rally because a lot of stuff has been going up, even in the face of some worry here and some worry there, and stocks are resilient. Yeah, I, look, I, I think uh, one of the things that's been the hallmark of the way the market has acted this year, we've had huge leadership from giant technology companies, of course, but we've also had so much action in other sectors, and we've had so much catch-up, it really demands that we just look and, and gauge how successful investors overall have been even in the most diversified of portfolios. The S&P on a total return basis, plus 23% on the year. Uh, not many people would have envisioned this scenario where we have 500 basis points worth of rate hikes and you get a positive 23% after a big year last year. But that's where we are. The Russell 2000 is not far behind. This year was the catch-up year, up 18% year to date. Plenty of room for that to go up on a valuation basis. The iShares Emerging Markets ETF is up 17%. That's a stealth bull market. It. We never talk about it other than China. And the Euro stocks, uh, FEZ, if you want to play, at ho uh, play along at home, is up 11%. 85% of the FTSE 100, that's England, are above their 10-day moving average. That's an explosive rally for that side of the pond. That's higher than any major index around the world. England is on fire, ladies and gentlemen. Look at Bitcoin and gold. The quote-unquote anti-stock trade. Well, those are working too. Bitcoin plus 45% year to date. Gold plus 32%. New all-time high today. Gold has made 35 new all-time highs this year. You almost can't lose. Bonds are up. The ag is up 4% on the year. Who knew? That's what's going on. Mm -hmm. So look at this situation that you're in right now. You have rate cuts coming from the Fed. We could debate how many or when. Fine. You have disinflation. You have nearly full employment, not quite what we had last year, but pretty damn close. And you're in a situation where the housing market is coming back to life. Investors look at their 401k. They're making money everywhere. Throw a dart. It's, it's one of those situations where you say, well, how could this get better? Let's say we get the election uncertainty out of the way in three weeks. That's how it gets better. And I think that's why you're in a tape that looks like a classic bull market, every sector, every country, every asset class, working, 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 working. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought all of that up. It sets us up perfectly for what we're gonna call new at noon today. Uh, and it's getting our hands on third points investor letter for the third quarter. Daniel Loeb, of course, um, one of the best around uh, as he talks to his investors about performance for the third quarter and what he foresees for the remainder of the year. And in, in large part, it plays off of some of the things that Josh is talking about as well. They were up uh, nearly 4% in Q3. Uh, Year-to-date returns, net of fees are 14%. But it, it's his commentary around the current market environment that I think is uh, not only interesting, but needs to be highlighted. And he goes back and talks about all of that volatility that spiked at the very beginning of August. You know, what was going on with Japan, the carry trade, et cetera. Uh, sort of everybody was kind of panicking, running for the hills. Not here. Uh, they were not. <clears throat> no, not here, but and, and not there. <laughs> there being uh, third point. Quote, we took our lumps for a few days, uh, but we stayed committed to our positions. We took the view that the market rotation would continue and increased our investments in event-driven and value-oriented stocks. Uh, we believe that the likelihood of a Republican victory in the White House has increased, which would have a positive impact on certain sectors and the market overall. Accordingly, we have increased certain positions that could benefit from such a scenario via both stock and option purchases and continue to shift our portfolio away from companies uh, that uh, will not. No evidence of recession. We believe healthy consumer spending and active levels of individual investing should provide a liquidity backdrop to sustain market levels. We think this setup is a particularly good one for event-driven investing. So there you got some latest commentary from uh, Daniel Loeb on what he sees. Uh, Shan, so, you know, Josh paints you a pretty good picture. Loeb 
sort of tells you exactly what he's thinking about, what we can do from here based on some outcomes that are ahead of us. How, how do you see it here? As we say, we hit record highs today again. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the this idea that broadening out had to come at the expense of technology and communication services, I think that's what we've seen has really not been borne out. We've had some idiosyncratic impacts in terms of the MAG-7, not necessarily the MAG-7 anymore, maybe the, the 5, if you will, the Fab 5. Um, but I think what's really important here is that this is all driven by this foundational expectation that economic growth is going to remain resilient. And most importantly... What Josh didn't mention and what we have been mentioning for months as a concern is the U.S. consumer. And the U.S. consumer has proven that we are starting to see, I think, a, a greater confidence that the U.S. consumer is going to be able to outlast um, this particular period and that we're going to see that rate relief. The other thing that we don't talk enough about, Scott, I think is that, you know, we talk a lot, a lot about the U.S. economy and the stock market as being interest rate insensitive. And we saw these meaningful gains in the, in the equity market over the last couple of years. There are plenty of sectors and industries that were very interest rate sensitive. And those are where, when you think about what Dan Loeb said, those, those value-oriented sectors, they fall into that camp. And so if you're expecting potentially an inflection point higher in industrial demand, industrial output, we're at the bottom of a major restocking cycle. We're going to, a destocking cycle, we're going to need to restock. We also have reshoring that's going to come onto the table. And we have a long lag in terms of the amount of stimulus that hasn't even been put into the economy yet. There are a lot of inflection points for value, for cyclicals, and to Josh's point for small cap, that we're just at the front end of. And I think that's why you're going to continue to see this broadening out. We could talk about on any given day the strength of NVIDIA or the strength of Microsoft, Amazon. We've got those earnings coming up. But the bottom line is that it's not going to be, we're not going to see that at the expense of the broadening out. Stocks going up, economy good, consumers still spending, and the Fed's cutting. And now you, you're going to have a return of, of deal making, M&A? Which, to which, add to the soup? Yeah, which definitely you were hearing in bank earnings, by the way, that, that M&A uh, advisory fees are picking up. And, and uh, the IPO calendar, while it's been dormant, has been more than offset by a strong debt market. However, having said all that, we've just gone through, uh, all four of us, the positives facing the market. I'd like to turn the question on its end and say, why would you sell here? And I know I've said this a few times over the last two weeks. I've talked about, you know, you don't want to take capital gains if you're a taxable investor this late in the year or if you're a professional money manager. You certainly don't want to sell and fall behind the benchmark. But let me put it a little bit bigger than that and say, if you were going to sell, you'd have to have a cogent reason. Usually those cogent reasons are big things like a financial institution blowing up. Not likely to happen as the Fed is cutting interest rates. We can debate how fast they're going to cut interest rates, but the simple fact is they're taking the pressure off of the financial sector. Uh, or we can look abroad and say, hey, geopol uh, geopolitical risks uh, abound. But you know what? They've abounded for two and a half years, and this market and this U.S. economy have powered through. So, yes, somebody is probably listening to me and saying, what about the election? Sure. I have no idea how the election is going to turn out. And frankly, if you gave me the news ahead of time, I, I defy anyone on how to trade it. You can just look at the 2016 election and the knee-jerk selling that happened after that election uh, as indica indicative of you shouldn't do the first thing that comes to mind answer, when the election to answer comes your, out. I know it was rhetorical, but to answer your question, why would you want to sell now? I actually was answering it, but please, please. Well, well the, the answer three weeks ago would have been uh, Kamala Harris is talking about raising capital gains tax. And we don't know if they do that at the end of 25 and make it retroactive for all of 25. So you have people sitting in gains two, 300% in some really big stocks. That might be the reason. If you believe the polling, you're less worried about that now than you were three weeks ago. And you're more focused on, oh my God, maybe small caps ripping is a sign that none of this is gonna come to pass. Uh, maybe bet. Here's the banks. 94% of S&P 500 financials are above their 50-day. Think about when is the last time you've really been able to say that? The median percentage off the 52-week highs for every company in the financials is 2%, minus 2%. They're all at highs. The median RSI for financials is 66. They're all in their own individual bull markets. That's telling you worry less about the election and think more about what 2025 is going Look, to Look, it's a great point, and I just want to address this. It's a great point. If, if you do get uh, a rise in capital gains, a rise in buyback taxes, that could be negative. But let's face it, you'd have to have a Democratic sweep of both houses of not Congress. Not going to happen, right. I mean, the market clearly is not voting in that direction. Exactly. Let's no. just say exactly. the semis at, at various times, NVIDIA included, would have you question the durability, at least in, you know, in a short-term nature of that trade. And then you get something like a Taiwan Semi.
which we've made our chart of the day today because it's soaring today. Best day since uh, March, uh, excuse me, May, late May of 23. They had a strong report and a guide. It's up 12%. NVIDIA's up, Broadcom's up. Uh, NVIDIA's at a new high, uh, by the way, as well. And it's right on the heels of Apple in terms of market cap. But this has been an important trade. It's looked a little rocky, if not lumpy, yeah. at certain points. And thank you, Taiwan Semi, right? Like Applied Materials, like Jim Labenthal bought more of. Uh, already owns NVIDIA. You know he owns Qualcomm. This is a name that's up 16% year to date. Uh, why'd you buy more, AMAT? Well, I had started it earlier this year, Scott, and when you start a position, it's a small position. It got knocked down hard the other day when that ASML uh, earnings release came out ahead of schedule. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to get in. Look, I understand the ASML news was not good, but you're in a secular bull market for building semiconductor plants. It's both because of the demand for semiconductors, it's also because of the geographic reconfiguration that's going on because of geopolitical risks. That's going to inure to the benefit of all the semicap equipment manufacturers. You know, AMAT has done a lot better over the last one and two years than ASML. ASML is a fine company, but the fact that it has a quasi-monopoly has basically given it a valuation that makes it very susceptible when bad news comes out. AMAT doesn't quite have that problem. And again, this just gave me a great opportunity to get in, uh, to increase a secular uh, position for. Him. You want to talk about Nvidia? Here, as we say, new all-time high, uh, yeah. right on the heels of Apple in terms of overall market cap leadership in this, in this, uh, in the market. Look, this is just one of those situations where, until they materially stumble, fundamentally, like miss a miss a delivery or have some sort of like a manufacturing issue, like until something like that happens, people just come into this name, and I don't even know if we do. Do we all remember on this desk? Literally, this stock was in a 24% drawdown in September. Mm -hmm. You know how many people said if Nvidia ever has a correction, I'll buy it. I don't. Did they? Did they? Buy, did they buy it? When it was or, 100. When it was 100 bucks. Yeah. Right. Or did they say, oh, it's in a 24% correction. <laughs> it's over. It, a lot of people that said, oh, I can't wait for it to come in. That's where I'll buy. Well, it did come in. Didn't last long. And and yet again, you have outrageous options activity in the stock. It's and at all time highs. It's so rare that you see the second largest publicly traded company in the world have the level of options activity, bullish call spreads this time um, that you have right now. And this has just been like a recurring nightmare for people that are trying to manage a portfolio that's benchmarked to the S&P. This is like high beta, gigantic weighting. How do you fight this? There's almost no other stock that acts like it. And listen, I submit. This is a really tough name at today's valuation. You could love the business, but if you have no position and you're watching this thing take out 140 as I'm talking, it's like, oh my God, how, how am I not in the stock? Yeah. And yeah. I talk to these people and I know, I know. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, people who have not been in have gotten in uh, what they thought was late and it hasn't turned out necessarily to be late. Uh, back to the market because there's a big earnings report after the bell, as you know. It is Netflix. That stock has been on a nice run. We'll show you the chart as Julia Borston gives us the setup here on what we should really expect here, which is a typical uh, volatile quarter for Netflix, right? Yeah, well, Netflix is always one that moves after that report. And Netflix shares may be down today, but the stock did hit all-time highs this month, and it has nearly doubled in the past year. And still, despite those gains, two-thirds of analysts have a buy rating on the stock. Just yesterday, Loop raising its price target to $800, saying fundamentals continue improving, also projecting a price increase in the standard tier shortly. Now, in addition to a price hike, investors are also looking for any ongoing benefit from Netflix's crackdown on password sharing, as well as the impact of Netflix's growing ad business. And while Netflix will stop reporting subscribers starting next year, this quarter, analysts want to see the addition of more than four and a half million new subs. Scott, I know they don't want us to focus as much on subs anymore, but we're going going to until they stop reporting those numbers. We've been too conditioned not to. You know, I saw the interview, Julia, with the loop analyst earlier who, who painted a, a pretty, pretty picture, uh, a pretty nice looking picture, I should say, for, for Netflix of um, legacy media players mostly losing money in streaming, uh, competition spending less now to get subs. Consolidation means that they have fewer players, they being Netflix, to compete with. So the environment looks pretty good right now for this company as the stock's right around 700 bucks again.
Yeah, and I think there's this big conversation now about the price hike that Netflix is, is expected to do before the end of the year. And there, there is a sense that they have the, the price elasticity that they'll be able to charge more, especially as they start offering these new sporting events. So with some of these sporting events, like boxing matches, they're sort of creating on their own. But some of them, like the NFL, are a big shift for them. They're going to have two games on Christmas Day. And there is a sense that if they raise prices before the NFL game, and also before the launch of the next season of Squid Games, people are going to be willing to pay more. Julia, thanks. We'll see you throughout the day. That's Julia Borston. You don't own the stock, but I, I know you have views. Yeah, I've been in the stock before. I wish I were in it right now. Um, they're looking to come in at $5.09. This quarter last year, they did four seventy-three, four and a half million subs. That's versus $8 million last quarter, $9 million the prior quarter. So there is a deceleration, but it's not negative. If, if, because if, if we're going to just count subs and that's going to be the story here, they can introduce a $3 tier. They could say, they could say, oh, we introduced a new tier. New tier. Look, we have uh, 20 million subs. That's not what Wall Street should want. And that's why it's so important to get out of that business. Apple did it 10 years ago. I was on the show and we had people arguing, oh, that's the end of Apple. No, it was just the beginning because it's the wrong metric. The metric is engagement, how many hours people spend, how likely they are to cancel or not cancel, and how easily they can continue to be monetized. And it's crazy. They did this ad tier and people said, oh, it's going to cannibalize the, the higher end tier. No, you had it backwards. The ad supported tier are more profitable subs than anything else they do. These are people paying and being advertised to. And by the way, the advertising algorithm continues to get better. So I still like the story. I'm playing this via the trade desk, which has an ad deal with Netflix and also with everybody else. I think it's the stronger story right now as far as future upside. But I do think that Netflix has shut its critics up and they'll be just fine when they stop reporting subs. In fact, it'll be a, a, a relief for us to focus on the fundamentals instead. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we hit more committee stocks on the move today, including some interesting deal chatter around Uber. Josh, of course, as you know, is in that trade, which means he has a take on that, too. Plus, let's talk some Uber. Let's show the chart here on this name, because uh, CNBC has confirmed that Uber discussed a bid for Expedia. That uh, news coming out. About a day ago, there's the stock down a little bit today. Uh, Deirdre Bosa reporting, uh, per a source familiar, there are no active discussions right now, but that a third party broached the idea and the initial exploration of a deal was at the early stages, the earliest stages. Josh, what do you make of this news? Would you, would you have wanted something to happen? Do you, do you think this would be a good thing? What do you think? Yeah, no, I think it's great. Uh, I heard Dan Ives on, on CNBC earlier today. I totally agreed with his take. Um, he, he was dressed better than I am right now, but he and I are on the same page here. The super app should be the goal, and watching Uber go from playing defense and defending themselves against all these municipalities and labor unions and blah, 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 that's now in the past, and Dara has gotten the market cap here and the cash flows and the fundamentals to the point where he can look around and say, what else would I do a better job of running uh, than, than somebody else? And as the Gen Z kids say, Buying the company you used to be the CEO of is diabolical. I absolutely love every aspect of this if it were to come to pass. I don't know what like the, val the deal valuation would be, but please remember, Dara is a protege of Barry Diller. Barry Diller's thesis for the internet circa 1997 was that these standalone entities make no sense. They need to be owned in combination with each other in order to get the synergies and the lock-in and the, and the ad deals, et cetera. So I, I think it's smart. There's obviously a link between taking a car home from the airport and having your flight and your hotel bundled with that experience. I think we would all appreciate it. Um, but even if it doesn't happen, I remain one of the biggest bulls on Uber on the street because I think we're witnessing the birth of a new MAG7 name. This is a TAM transport of humans, of dinners, of, of cargo and freight. This is a TAM that is reminiscent of the TAMs that we've seen the other MAG7 names ultimately grow into. So it's not a trillion dollar company overnight, but it's one of those companies that if they maintain market share, it could get there buying Expedia or not buying Expedia. And look at this thing. They try to open it down like it was a bad deal or people were nervous. It might go green right now. People like to see these giant companies playing offense, and Dara can play with the best All of them. Right, speaking of 
Let's talk some CrowdStrike, uh, because your guy Ives, who you mentioned earlier, says uh, maintain, outperform. Price target, though, I'm raising to 330 from 315. It's about to bump up against the old one anyway. What do you think here? I think that the way that they have overcome this, uh, this issue really should be studied, like uh, corporate comms professionals and PR firms and in, in colleges across America, they should look at this as like a case study. When you really screw something up badly, what do you do about it? How do, and this was like as big as it gets. This was a global issue, shut down all the airlines. So uh, I think we're like with every passing day, it's moving into the rear view and people are refocusing on the fundamentals of CrowdStrike, the competitive advantages that the company's platform has. And so long as that's the case, I think the stock works. So I never sold a share sit sitting long, uh, didn't panic, and I hope other people didn't panic either. All right, Chenier, top pick at B of A. Jimmy, you own the stock, it's targets uh, 215. So a uh, nice little upside that they expect. Uh, they expect free cash flow inflecting towards 20 bucks a share. And I completely agree. I'm not sure I would make it my top pick, but it's definitely in a portfolio of 25 stocks. It's in the upper quintile of stocks. They probably that I love. have a list of top picks that they've probably added it to. Okay. But my, I digress. Please my, continue. Uh, yeah, you know, it was the superlative, the top. Anyway, look, it's a great company. What it does is LNG exports. I think there may be a play here if Republicans take over the White House and/or Congress that the moratorium on building uh, new export terminals uh, will be removed. That should be bullish for liquefied natural gas. On the other hand, they already have all the export terminals in operation that they need, but still the sentiment should, should improve. I do agree with the pick, whether it's the top pick or amongst the top picks. All right, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, 3M, Josh, Target, 146. The old yeah. one was 105. Yeah. So they needed to raise it because 105 was so long ago. Yeah. Uh, Mizuho, they call it neutral, which sort of matches with what I'm talking about. Go ahead. Look, I get, I get it because it's not a cheap stock anymore. It was cheap when, when, uh, when I bought into it. I know Stephanie is long. Are you, do you own this? 3M? No? no, I do not. Some other people I on know, the show. It sounds like yeah, something Stephanie, I should. Stephanie does. This sounds like a, a Labenthal special. Yeah. Anyway, it's not a cheap stock anymore, and it's highly cyclical. <laughs> and and when cyclicals are selling at that the upper end of the historic valuation range, if you're a shareholder, question has to be like, all right, well, what next? The thing here, though, is it's going to be such a long uh, period of time as the turnaround takes place and they start lapping the bad news of last year and the year before that I still think there's room for upside surprise and improvements to the business and you have new management you don't know where they're going to take this company so I'm willing to stick around I have a stop loss um, but I'm, I'm willing to stick with it I get the neutral rating though he likes 2c over 3m you get it no Cleveland Cliffs. Oh, God. Oh, I thought we were doing anti-bullying guy. I thought we were doing anti-bullying guy. Seriously. Come on. Uh, that, I thought that, that was funny. Remember he liked J.C. Penney, just saying? We, we, I know, but that doesn't I, go with the I joke. Know, this is, this doesn't go with the this joke. This is the anti-anti-bullying. It doesn't go with the joke. <laughs> Sorry. Abbott Labs, price target, also at Mizuho, to 130 from 115. Yeah, well, they Carrie. passed 115, so good move, guys. Um, they had a decent quarter. It, it was better than expected. They're turning things around with nutrition, much better on the COVID testing front than anyone anticipated. And diagnostics looks good. Buying back stock, we continue to think it has upside. Okay, uh, AbbVie gets a, uh, a call today. Bernstein initiating on biopharma. Market perform. Jimmy, you call it a full position, 203. Yeah, I think it's a, market, a price target there. I think it's a market outperform, frankly. I mean, it's a very forgiving valuation in the high teens, nice 3% dividend yield, and management has done simply a fabulous job of taking care of the Humira uh, patent cliff expiration there. They've replaced it with Skyrizi and Rinvoke. They've made key acquisitions, and now they're bringing out the schizophrenia drug. This is this is market outperform. Well, the K-Web China Internet ETF is under pressure yet again today. It's now down 10% in a week. However... Some technicians say you have another opportunity now to get in. Jonathan Krinsky is one of them, BTIG. He says, quote, the recent pullback creates a secondary entry point. Josh Brown, it was your contrarian call. It obviously was up a lot. Then it was down a bunch. It's been really volatile. What do we do now? Do we, do we listen to Krinsky and we say we have another chance to get in? I think if you're listening to Krinsky, you have to be aware that he's making a tactical call, not an investment call. I think the investment call is harder. The tactical call is probably easier. This is, an, this is a, an ETF that moves drastically in response to news flow. And the one thing we know for sure is that Chinese authorities are hell-bent 
on creating this aura of, hey, we're investable again, not just overseas, but uh, aimed at the, the local market. So if you believe that there'll be more on that front, Krinsky's call probably works. If you're like a longer term investor, he's a technician. They don't, you know, don't don't conflate the two things. So I don't know about the investable side, the trading side. I think he has something here. Not to mention, you know, when when David Tepper came on the network and made his call um, that was such a powerful and powerfully delivered message about what the I ideas are. Um, he's as tactical as anybody, too. I'm glad you, you said the difference between tactical trading and then fundamental investing over a longer period of time, because in instances where, you know, he could lay out a great case that some may take as a very long term thing uh, can be reversed really at, at any moment uh, because he's one of tactically uh, along with he's a he's a long term the, the best who's ever done it. He's so I just want to put that out there since yeah. you, you try yeah. and make the difference between the two in the way that we should think about the way that these um, these things should work. Te all right, Tepper, Druck and Miller, these are geniuses. And the genius is not something that could be quantified or put into a formula. If it could, then there'd be 50 of them. And there aren't. There's one Druck and Miller, there's one Tepper, and they have this sixth sense that it's almost supernatural at these major turning points in the market where they just know this is when you get in or this is when you get out. But part of that genius is that they have no problem reversing themselves and they don't explain it to an investment committee, right? These are, these are, these are guys that explain it to no one but themselves at this point in life. And so if you're like watching at home and you're trying to ride the coattails of somebody that could be full in long, the next day neutral, and the day after that right. full in well, short, how, how are you gonna how are you gonna do that? That's why when the you know the filings come out and they're always backward looking, we, we, always, we always tell people take most of this with a grain yeah. of salt because you never know when it comes to some of the greatest investors how tactically um, you know maneuvering, if you will, they are. We'll come back uh, after a quick break. We have a trade update on a stock. Josh pitched to a very special guest on this show. <laughs> Al, could I could I could I pitch you a stock? Yes, you can. The name of the company is eBay. Ticker symbol, believe it or not, eBay. Now, <laughs> yep. this stock just popped up on my firm's list of the best stocks in the market, currently making a 52-week high. This is a company that does $10 billion a year in revenue, $30 billion market cap, and inexplicably, it seems to be defying gravity. Josh, not only uh, am I going to buy it, I am quick on the trigger. I already bought 1,000 shares. <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't waste any time. Um, and I guess he's glad he did because the stock's up 10% since. Yeah. So Al's getting ready for a call, obviously, tonight. Uh, yep. He's got a football game to, uh, to think about. But what's, what's, what, what do you tell him now about the stock? Well, look, this is, this is a, a situation where we bought it on technicals. It was dirt cheap fundamentally. I think it was 10 times earnings when we got in. It's not materially above that. And you have the holiday season coming up, and eBay's trying to make a big splash this year. Uh, and so I think you could stay with it. If you want to risk manage the position, and you've got like a shorter term time horizon, you've got a trailing stop at about $61. We visit that every Friday. Uh, that's your, that's your uh, rising 50 day. And I think it's pretty simple from here. All right, good stuff. Uh, we'll find out next time whether Al still holds that name. Final trades are next. I just have a, I have a trade update from Al. He's still in the name. All right, so <laughs> just wanted to get that out there, finish up business. All right, final trade, Jimmy. Disney. Ash Teed Group. Okay. Sunbelt Rentals is what it's. Sunbelt okay. Rentals right. for the hurricane people. Chen. Uh, healthcare. Thank you. Downtown Josh Brown. New all-time high, TTT. TTD. Raise the roof. TTD. All right, Trade desk. What's up? See you on the exchange. I mean, I'll see you on closing bell. You don't know what's going on. I won't. Hello and welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. My name is George. It is Thursday, October 17th. It's 4.35 p.m. after the market close. And we just saw another episode of Josh Brown on the halftime report. We saw some clips, some of the highlights, and we're going to look at some of those stocks that were recommended here at the end. Some of the final trades plus eBay, China, internet stocks. We'll also take a look at the indices. I have a bunch of uh, ETFs here related to different types of indice ETFs, small cap, mid cap, large cap, and sectors. We'll look at the f some of the Fab 7 stocks, and we'll also take a look at three stocks that were requested from our members. So without further ado, let's take a look at 
the indices and how did they perform today it was a mixed bag here as you can see we basically had the dow up 0.37 percent not that much at the end of the day nasdaq was up just 0.04 percent very flat we had the s p 500 down just 0.02 also very flat and the russell 2000 was slightly down at 0.27 percent uh, let's look at the heat map so you can see right here that um and this of course is the s p 500 and what what you see essentially is that most of the semiconductors did pretty well financials did okay um but healthcare plans not so great looks like railroad stocks like csx and unp didn't do so well energy stocks did well consumer defensive is not that great it was kind of flat um, basic materials was looking pretty strong today and so were the industrials okay so, and then finally let's look at the one day performance and you can see here that um let me zoom in and refresh this make sure it's up to date okay technology energy financials basic materials and industrials were the top four and then um and industrial was just down 0.12 percent and then you had utilities real estate communication services and healthcare down the most um again it wasn't a really big down day it is thursday we're almost at the end of the week now so the one week performance so far though financials utilities real estate industrials are looking the strongest and energy the weakest so let's take a look at those stocks that they recommended ebay josh's other recommendation so this was one of the stocks that he recommended to his friend there that you saw at the uh, end of the show um and this stock has done great it has done pretty well i mean um but guess what guys all good things eventually come to an end and i'm predicting right here and you guys can follow this in the future and check to see if i'm correct in my assessment this is it game over for ebay why do i say that well it's not just because it was it dropped 2.33 percent um but earnings are coming out on october 30th the fact that it broke down today with such vigor and closed under the tankinson you can see that big drop it also took out these lows here so it was consolidating for a little while and then we had this big breakdown what that tells me is people are coming out of this trade they want to preserve their profits i mean they this this uh, look at this big run we're talking about a run now uh from the time that it broke above the cloud which is going back to this area right here you can see the little tiny candle right there where it broke above the cloud it's had a big run never came back into the cloud since then i, I take that back right here sorry it, this is the the last breakout of the cloud right there on may 21st of 2024 since that point it's moved up 25 percent so it's had a nice move I think this is uh, the time to get off the train, basically. Okay, um, and this is what the weekly chart looks like. It's not a bullish candle. It's starting to form a shooting star type negative reversal candle, and you don't want to be holding into that, especially into earnings when you start seeing it this far away from Tankinson. It can have a, a quick drop of about six to seven percent in no time, basically. TTD, the trade desk, is another one of uh, that was Josh Brown's final trade. This is the weekly chart. Still moving up. Not a big fan of this candle, but it's still forming. We'll know for sure on Friday what that looks like. On the daily chart, we're just in a consolidation zone. So this is a stock that's also been doing pretty well. Um, but yeah, you want to basically, I would not be entering a long position until you get above the highs here. The high of that candle is 118.82 or 118.90, that's the level that I'd be looking at. KWEB, Josh Brown said this looks bullish from a tradable side. I disagree with that. He was talking about whether or not this um, ETF is good from an investable side versus tradable side. Um, it's neither. Uh, I think that it's a mistake to consider getting into the China internet ETF. Um, I mean, look at this volatility. And by the way, this stock was not very volatile before. Look at these tiny little candles, right? It was just strumming along. Uh, in fact, the beta is just 0.29 because all these collective little tiny um, small moves, all right, that's what led to creating this, this ratio here. But right now, that's not no longer relevant, okay? So I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. You can see the crazy volatility here of this stock, of this ETF. Here's what happened, right? 
the Chinese government got involved and it's helped to push the this ETF up. The question is, how long will this last? And it's already showing signs of complete weakness. Um, it burst and broke. First, it came into the cloud, right? That's the first step. Broke above and closed above the cloud. Okay, so let's hypothetically say you entered this position here on September 24th when it made sense to. Since that point, if you measure, it made a nice move up about 34.7% in 13 days. 13 days. Think about that for a moment, that volatility. Um, now, how much has it given back in these last few weeks? A lot. It Now, from that point, you're only up 7%. 7.19% from this breakout. And it's broken down. It created a hammer here, closed under the Tankinson. That's the midpoint of the last nine periods. And right there, I would say that's the right time to get out, basically. Just like I feel the same thing with eBay. Look at how eBay held above the Tankinson so perfectly, right? All these days, multiple, multiple days. I mean, going back all the way back to this point here, August 19th, it made a nice run, about 15.63% or so, 15.3%. So my point is when the chart starts telling you it's time to go, to get out, listen to it. Pay attention, guys. This has dropped now. From this point, it has dropped approximately 11%. In how many days? Um, just nine days. So nine days. So consider that. <clears throat> All right, let's keep going here. ASHTF was Carrie's final trade. Now this one, Ashton Group. You can see see how the candles are like tiny, little flat lines. The reason for that is, if you look down below, two thousand one hundred shares traded per day. That's a very very low number. Not very not a lot of volume means that it's also difficult to exit a trade like this. And you're gonna have crazy gaps like what you're seeing here. It'll gap down one day, gap up the next day, gap up again, gap up again. You'll have all these weird uh, mo movements. And uh, so for that reason, I, I strongly recommend against her recommendation here, Carrie's recommendation. 2,100 shares is nothing in comparison. You wanna look for shares for stocks with on average a million shares or more. That's what you wanna look for. Uh, but I mean, technically, yes, it does look good. It's above the cloud on both the Tengsen and Kijinsen, but I'd stay out of this one. IYH is the healthcare sector. That was Shannon's final trade, both on October 9th and on October 17th. And you can see, um, what, here's what's happened. And uh, here's one more that I think that you have to watch out for because it broke through this low. Do you see this one, this prior low here? Once that occurred and we had a to double top sort of situation right here. So it broke through that low, that breaks the whole trend. This trend is no longer in an uptrend anymore. We have a lower high here from this high. We have a lower low here from this low. So it's basically stepping down, okay? There's a step down going on here. And when you have that, expect a continued decline. So I would not be entering here. This is not a good entry point, when it, especially when it's closing under the tank. And you can see that the uh, green line there crossed under the red line. So the red line represents the midpoint of the last 26 periods. The green line, of course, as I said earlier, the midpoint of the nine periods is a little faster. And the, the cloud itself is based on, it's taking the, the Sanker Span A, the top part of the cloud there, is based on taking the midpoint of these two moving averages and projects it 26 periods into the future. And this purple line here, is the Senku Span B, that's um, based on the midpoint of the last 52 periods. But as you can see, it can also flatten out because it's taking the midpoint, it's not like a traditional moving average that looks at closing prices. It's looking at the midpoint. And so you can see it flatten out multiple times. When that happens, that becomes a much stronger level of support if it ever comes back down to it. So you might get a bounce, for example, and it could continue. But if it breaks under, that's also an even more significant reason to get out of a stock or ETF. And um, as you can see back here, right? See that decline right there and over here? So, and right here for temporarily broke under. So right now, I would stay out of that one. Okay, DIS is Disney. That was Jim Leventhal's final trade. 
Now this one on the weekly chart, let's look at that. He also recommended it on September 27th. Disney is under the cloud and on the weekly chart. And so what does that mean? Well, I personally like to look at both the weekly and the daily. I like to get, first I'd like to see where's the overall long-term uh, technicals. What does that look like from a, on a weekly chart? Each one of these candles represents one week in time. You can see the months down below. You can see the, you know, the dollar amounts here on the right. And when price, we can see when it got under the Tengensen back here. It closed back on April 12th, April 12th of 2024. So it got under Tengensen after that nice move up. So what did this lead to? It led to a huge decline in Disney. It dropped approximately 26% in 3.9 months. During this entire time, there hasn't been a reason to enter a long position. Why? Because the rules of Ichimoku, this indicator here, you never enter a long position when price is under the midpoint of the last nine periods or the midpoint of the last 26 periods or inside the cloud or under the cloud. And this whole time we've been under the moving averages, then under the cloud, and we're still under the cloud. So you don't, you just hold off on Disney. And then, you know, now just because it looks this way on the weekly chart, and again, that's, it could, you could have a completely different picture on the, di on the daily. So we're going to switch over. You can see now it's breaking above, right? So in the beginning stages, it's always going to give us the first buy signals on the daily chart. And you can take that risk if you want to. You know, if you want to be early in on this trade, you, you can just trade the daily chart. But I'm just saying, right now, you don't have the wind on your back 100% yet. We're also coming to a level of resistance right here based on September 30th's um, high. So at a minimum, you'd want to get above uh, 97.78 if you're considering Disney. All right, let's keep going here. We're going to run through these very quickly, the indices. SPHD, high dividend portfolio, looking good, up 0.29%, still holding, I'm sorry, it was down 0.29, but it's still holding above the 50-63 level, so that's bullish. Um, small cap, IJR, let me just make this a little smaller here, there we go. And let's move that, whoops, just want to make sure we get a good representation here so you can see that. So, notice how it touched right there, that was back on September 19th came back to that level, found resistance, still finding resistance. So I would hold off on the small cap 600. We may get a, a pullback here. That's a reversal candle, it's called a hammer. Most of you are familiar with it, if you're not, or they also call it a hanging man because it's like a long wick with a small body at the top and it's bearish. It's a single pattern. After a move up, if you see this candle, all right, and you see price getting under the low of that candle, then expect it to continue to decline. Here are some other bearish candles. The Shooting Star, that's a negative one. The Gravestone Doji right there. It's got a flatter type body. You get your bearish spinning tops. If they happen on the top of a move, that's negative. Now, you know, what's interesting, however, is if you look at the uh, single pattern patterns down here, if you get those exact same types of candles, but they happen after a decline, so at the bottom of a move, that's actually bullish. You can call that a hammer. This one is called an inverse hammer. This one here is called the dra dragonfly. This candle right here, flat with a fl basically a, a long wick with a flat body at the top. And then you got the bullish spinning top. Normally you wanna see a bullish candle too with a, a wick that's equal on the top as it is on the bottom. When you get those single patterns, and of course there's more here, if you guys wanna access this and get a copy of this for free, go to my Twitter page. Um, it's at Blue Cloud Trader, all right? You can find the link on my page, on my YouTube homepage. Just look under the links section. Uh, let's see, so IJR, I'd stay out of that one. RSP. Still moving up. This is the S&P 500 equal weight, still holding up above the cloud, this box, above the moving averages. It was down 0.16%. Nothing major here, folks. IWR, like I said, it was a flat day today, down 0.12%, nothing major. The mid cap ETF looks good, IWR. SPHQ is the high quality portfolio for the S&P 500. 
also just down 0.03% today. The SPY up just 0.01, nothing major. SPLG still holding up above the moving averages. That's the large cap. That looks good to just up 0.03. The Qs still holding up just up 0.07. Dow up 0.40. I like that jump for the Dow, DIA ETF. So this one looks the strongest out of the out of the bunch, right? For today, at least. The VIX dropped a little more. That's good, but found a little support there at the Keijin Sen. So that's, I'd like to see it break under there. We want that VIX to continue dropping, basically. And then IWM, the Russell 2000, dropped 0.27%. However, unlike the IJR, where it's finding resistance here, the Russell 2000 looks a little more bullish because it's broken above that level back on um, Wednesday, yesterday, October 16th, and now it's staying above it. See how it came down, retested that level, whoops, retested this area here, and then bounced up to that area. So it closed right there, but still looks okay, you know? Um, okay, let's look at the sectors and ETFs very quickly. SMH, so this is interesting. We had a nice big move up, up 1.72%, but I'm not excited about this situation. Look where it stopped. It stopped at this prior high, 255.75. had drawn this a while back on July 17th. You can see the creation of that um, level. And I mean, the fact that it is finding resistance, and then not only that, it closed under the Tankinson. It's very suspicious to me. I think it might drop some more, okay? Um, GLD looks very bullish, up 0.60%. Why does it look very bullish? Because it broke through this consolidation right here. You can see this little area here. And it, it broke above that 247.37. I like gold, GLD, energy. Inside equilibrium, it's under the tank. It's in, so I'd hold off on energy right now. It was up 0.48% though. XLK dropped a little bit today. Um, actually, it was up 0.31, but it, you can see it in the morning. Here's what happened. It gapped up right there and then it closed down so this is what it looked like if you look at the five minute it had that big gap up in the morning and then it went sideways and dropped under the cloud so it's not a really bullish candle technology even though it was up 0.31 looks can be deceiving right percentages can sometimes be perceived um can can sometimes be deceiving so you have to really pay attention to those candles they, they tell you a whole lot of what's transpiring between the buyers and the sellers throughout the day so when you see those big red candles you know be very wary um U u.s dollar interesting okay so it was finding some resistance here yesterday broke through okay broke through that 29 dollar level look at it now it's jumping some more up 0.31 percent let's look at the weekly chart all right, where is it going to find resistance next? Um, it looks like it's going to find resistance right there. What's the high there? The high is 29.20. Right there, we'll color that light blue to signify the weekly chart. So that's your next target, basically. And I think that's about, what is that? About 0.34% away. XLF Financials looks very strong, up 0.27%. There's the weekly on the daily chart. It's still moving up. However, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this little candle. This is a new candle that I'd be watching. It's kind of, it looks very similar to like a gravestone doji type candle. Very close to that. XLB is um, creating a negative reversal candle here on materials, but it's above the moving averages, just up 0.15%. It's also come close to a level of resistance right here. You can see that prior high. Not a place that I would enter a long position. Silver, down 0.07%, just kind of stuck a little bit. Uh, consumer discretionary, down 0.09, nothing major happening here. Industrial is looking pretty good overall, even though it was down 0.29. Um, you've got your treasury inflation protection still stuck inside a box here. Okay, consolidating for now. Nothing to do there, bond. Like I said before, not looking particularly strong here. It's under the inside the cloud. You don't want to be entering a long position here. 
Consumer Staples is uh, created this reversal candle. Question is, what's going to happen here? I don't know. It's, it looks like it's getting stuck in between the two moving averages, so I'd hold off on that one. XLC could not really, you know, did not really did not break above 90, 98 yet, but it might soon. So that's an, an area that you want to watch closely. It's, we're stuck in this little box, right? We need to get a breakout first before we can consider a long position here. Um, let's see here. XLV, healthcare is inside the cloud. Nothing to do here. It's um, not looking bullish at all. Like I mentioned earlier, we were looking at another ETF. Real estate, uh, down 0.65%. We've got the Tenkinson under Kijunson. That's not good. We've got the Chiku span. So I didn't talk about that earlier in this video, but this white line here that you see in the background, that's really just closing price projected 26 periods into the past right there. And you want to see where that is in relation to the candle 26 periods ago. If that white line has closed above the candle, that's very bullish. If it's under like it is right here, that's bearish. So I would not be entering a long position with real estate at this time. XHB, stuck in a box. You can see it right here. Uh, stay out of that one for now. Utilities uh, is, um, it looks like it retested. Let me see this area. It did break above it, but then it just quickly broke right under. Creating a bearish pattern, actually. It's called a dark cloud cover. It's this pattern right here, these two candles. And it looks like this right here, dark cloud cover. After a move up, you get this bullish candle. You'll notice the price gaps up in the morning and then closes within the body of the candle. That's negative. So I would not be entering a long position here. And utilities today or tomorrow based on what I'm seeing here. Now, we did get a nice buy signal here on October 14th. So let's see if it can, can you know, we want to see it break and continue to stay above the high here of 82.06. Let me just throw that level in there for now so we can keep an eye on it. 82.06, that's the high of this candle. Right now it's under it. Bitcoin, isn't this interesting how it just kind of dropped and where did it stop? Right on this trend line that I had drawn in the past. So it found resistance at the top of the trend line based on these two highs. Found resistance there here and here, and now it dropped. Not surprising to me. TLT, still looking very bearish. Look what happened, guys. This is why I say when it's really important, stay, do not take long trades when price is under the cloud or inside the cloud. It came up right to the top here, found resistance there, and the sellers just threw it down. Uh, dropped some more, 1.58% today on high, higher volume. Copper is inside equilibrium zone. I would, it's it's still a hold, but it's not looking 100% you know, pr pretty here because it is holding up above this prior high. That's good, the 44.64. If it gets back under, it's more likely to drop some more. So watch out for copper. And all right, let's go through the Fab 7 quickly. Apple. We had this reversal candle here on, um, let me see, what day was that? Tuesday. It dropped under and staying under 232.64. Amazon. Josh Brown's final pick on October 15th is um, still not looking great. It was up 0.34%, but you can see it closed under the Kijunson today. So that's not good. Google, inside the cloud, stay out of this one. I've been saying that for a while now. Microsoft, same thing. Stay out of Microsoft for now. Tesla, inside the cloud. Look at this, guys. <laughs> Look how many days. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated when I see how price can be contained in these boxes. You know, they're, they're basically, it's basically taking a breather. And when we finally, we'll, we'll know which way this thing is going if price gets above or below the, the box. So just hold off. That's all. There's nothing to do here except for wait. Wait, it's a waiting game. You don't enter a long position. When you're inside of a box and consolidating, it's never a good idea to enter a long position or short position. You really don't know which way it's going to go. It's just sideways, right? It's basically a no man's land. Think of it like that. Um, okay.
next some of our members requests ura so let's look at the weekly chart first on this one it's coming close to 3366 all right so it's coming close to a level of resistance now when it does come close to levels of resistance like that you want to start thinking about taking profits here that's my recommendation uh, if you've been long in this and i don't know how long you if you have been or considering buying this is not the time to do it this would have been a nice entry point on the daily chart it has moved approximately 17 percent that'd be a nice this is a nice place to get out another reason i would say to get out is it's not only is it getting close to this resistance level but it's formed a spinning top what i say earlier that's a negative reversal candle so here's one of the things you could do is maybe place a stop under the low of that candle so if it gets under tomorrow you can it will automatically close out your position and you can preserve your profits it just makes sense um so that's the uranium and on the, let me look at that weekly again it looks good so if it breaks above 3366 i think uranium can certainly have a much bigger run okay but we have to wait for for the weekly but you'd have to w check on it every friday you know so like this friday it doesn't look like it's going to happen unless we have a big it would have to basically jump about three and a half to four percent tomorrow up you know in order to break and close above 3366 so we'll see if that happens and then verizon let's take a look at verizon here's the weekly chart um it's above the tenkinson and kijinson and the cloud so it looks very bullish there but on the daily chart i, I drew this trend line uh, these trend lines earlier we've got ourselves a potential decline here um, because it did close see this candle it closed under this low that's not a good sign we we still have a higher high here than this high but we do have a lower low than this low and so that sometimes can lead to a potential decline here's what i'd be watching at this point what you'd want to really be careful of is that price does not get under these lows here so the low there is uh, what is it 42.80 and yeah that looks like the, the lowest level so 42.80 on the daily chart if it gets under 42.80 and closes especially closes under that level right it could pierce it but if it closes under that level it's time to get out why because it will be forming a downtrend at that point this here will be a lower high from that high right as it drops through so you'll have a, a turning over here. And um, we get the lower low already from already established here. So let's hope that it can uh, bounce. Right now it's in the equilibrium zone. It's not a bad place to just wait it out and see what happens. You can see that there's no true direction here. When you look at the directional movement index, it's dropping. There's nothing major happening here. How about ZIM? There's another stock recommend um, that they would like me to check on. On the weekly chart, let's start with this one. It has recently broke through the cloud on May 17th, 2024. ZIM is in the shipping and ports industrials sector. Now, going back in time, let's go back in time a little bit and find this prior high. It was all the way back here. That goes to March 18th of 2022. It was around the 90, what was it, 84? Wait, the high was 91.23. So from 91.23, it did drop approximately 91 percent in 1.7 years now since this point though since this point right here it has moved up approximately 206 percent so it's had a nice run up we have established a higher low here whoops higher low here than this low we broke through this prior high if you see that here with that candle broke above the cloud there holding up above the Kijinson and the cloud it's inside of a consolidation and it may continue to, to jump forward but right now you've got some resistance above here so uh, the other problem you want to also take into account is the fact that the profit margin here is 32.8 negative 32.8 percent so I generally like to look for strong stocks that have strong fundamentals but if you're just playing this purely on the technicals it looks good on the weekly and on the daily chart we do have a higher high we have a higher low right this high is higher than that one this low is higher than that low 
but we're we, we, we're not quite there yet with uh, where price is. It's inside the Tengensen and Kijinsen. We got a lower, the Tengensen is under Kijinsen. That's not particularly strong. And so, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't look that great to me, honestly, as far as a, an entry point, okay? Not yet, at least. And guys, guess what? That's going to do it for this video. Now, I do have a promotion. You can stick around to listen about it. Some of you have already heard it a thousand times, so <laughs> you can skip it all and just, you know, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. But if you want to hear about this promotion, let's talk about it for a second. Um, basically, from my website here, my, or my homepage, Blue Cloud Trading, if you scroll down, if you guys like the software that I use, number one, you can get this software. Okay, and get a $25 coupon for the software. How do you do that? Number one, you go to this section, and five more links. Click on that and scroll down. And remember that cheat sheet that I mentioned earlier? This one? Whoops. You can get that for free by clicking on my Twitter link here. You'll find it at the very top. If you want to get the software, it's a $25 coupon. You click on this link. It will bring you to this page. You type in your email in here, and you can download it for Windows. If you have a Mac, you would have to get Parallels to run the, run this software. Otherwise, you can also use the, the web-based version. And uh, you can click on pricing to find out more about that there. And then if you guys want to find out about the promotion that I'm running this week, let me just show you. So every weekend, I create a members only video. And what I cover is my entire portfolio. And we usually run about 47 minutes. You can see that a lot. The one before, the week before on October 4th was 46 minutes, 51 minutes an hour. It's around that range. And I go into each and every stock that I hold in my portfolio, entries, exits throughout the week, um, and just summarize my entire portfolio. and. It's very useful. I also share in this video scan results for Friday um, from Friday's um, trading day. So like I have a proprietary scanner that looks through, you know, thousands, about over 6,000 stocks, and it finds the strongest ones with good technicals, good fundamentals on both the weekly and the daily. They look good and there's giving a new buy signal. That's the most important thing. And you can access those scans by going to the community tab here. Now, um, if you want to get more up to date trades, instead of just once a week, you want to get daily updates. All right. You just basically you can upgrade and you click on. So here you would hit the join button, right? Click join button. Oh, and the promotion, by the way, let me just mention that the promotion is you can get this one video, just one video for the week ending October 11th, where I just summarized this whole thing for just $4.99. Normally it's $24.99, and it's just for this week. So $4.99 to get that video. Now, if you upgrade to, to the Blue Cloud Trader level, which is $24.99, you'll get those videos every week, four times a month, um, and you can request stocks to be analyzed, uh, as I do for members. And then finally, if you wanna get daily updates, Okay, daily trade updates. When I actually place a trade, I once a day at the end of the close, at the close of the day, I usually will post um, the trades that I've placed that day. Th you'll find them in here under the community tab. So you can like follow along and uh, get some ideas and stuff from those, from those, you know, posts. Anyway, guys, thank you for supporting the channel. I appreciate you all. Hit the like and subscribe button and I will catch you all in the next video.